in a world where unpredictability is the norm and governments cannot be trusted to handle the basics of our failing healthcare system. People turn to coping mechanisms to alleviate their stress, sometimes forgetting that an alcohol-filled night can be fun for a while. It can also cause severe consequences the next morning. The people over 25 drinking like they're 20 can attest to this fact. These are their stories. Why? Tell me why did my roommate and I drink an entire bottle of Johnny Walker? Red label, why? Sway with me now. Tell me why mm. did my roommate and I, because you know I'm over 25, uh-huh, drink an entire bottle of Johnny Walker. Ooh. Red Lake key change, why, why, tell me why, why was I a fool, did my roommate and I, you know I'm almost 30 soon, drink an entire bottle of Johnny Walker. I'm so hungover. Hello and welcome slash welcome back to my channel. <laughs> my name is Khadija, your favorite internet play auntie. Hello to all my returning nieces, nephews, and nibblings, and my fellow aunties, uncles, and piblings. If you're new, feel free to take a look around, suss out the vibe. I sit on my floor and literally talk about whatever I want. So yeah, as I said in the opening, I am hungover. I was uh, not only a fool, I was boo-boo the fool. And last night, I was just like, I just, I'm not doing anything. You know, Toronto, we're in another lockdown. Cases are getting out of control. Ran into my roommate in the hall and I was like, yeah! You wanna just? And he was like, yeah. So we were both just like, okay. <sighs> so I don't have any eyebrows on right now. What you got on my face currently is Vaseline and, and a dream, okay? A dream that I will, once I'm done recording all of this, lie in this bed here and just weep for a while, you know what I'm saying? But enough about me and my bad decisions and my bad choices. It seems that a lot of y'all are wanting me to continue this stereotyping series, so that's... I foresee, I foresee all the work that I'm gonna have to do. I see now what I must become. Can't believe I dropped out of sociology to do book reports every week on the internet. Where's Norma? Exciting. For real, I am excited about it because I, I just like doing this stuff, love talking about this, love reading about this stuff. So I wanted to do this video today as a kind of um, a precursor, a syllabus, if you will, because a lot of the same themes are gonna come up in these videos I foresee, maybe not all of them, but generally. So this video will serve as a reference point, hopefully. Unlike most of my other videos, I'm only going to be relying on one source for this video, and that is this right here. I have talked about this book many a time, Representation. It is by Jessica Evans and Sean Nixon and edited by the great Stuart Hall. Anyone that's ever done a media studies anything knows who Stuart Hall is. So yeah, we're just gonna get into it. We're gonna talk about what stereotyping really is, actually defining it, and then break that down further into its usefulness and its limitations. We're gonna talk about four specific theories, analyzes, breakdownsies. <laughs> God, this is gonna be an interesting experience. One being the construction of the other and exclusion, representation, difference, and power, the role of fantasy, and fetishism. Mm. So yes, grab your snacks. If you're hungover too, grab your water. Thank you, thank you. Ooh, 
and let's get into it. Welcome to Black Jeopardy, the only Jeopardy where our prize money is paid in installments. So first, let's break down what stereotyping is and how it works within those themes that I mentioned earlier. As Evans and Nixon define it, stereotyping is the practice that, quote, reduces people to a few simple essential characteristics which are represented as fixed by nature. So you see someone in the body that they exist in and you already have a preconceived notion about what they're like based off of no evidence of engaging with them and slash or you think that this person is this way because that's just how it is. I'm saying you're a football player. It's in your blood. That's racist. Your soul. That's racist. Your eyes. That's gay. That's homophobic. Okay. That's black. That's racist. Damn. That's stereotyping. It's ignoring the complexities of someone's identity and whittling them down to a few characteristics, assuming that they were just born that way. The term stereotype was actually first introduced to our popular lexicon by writer and two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, Walter Lippmann, famously known for his book, Public Opinion, where he basically let the girls know this democracy shit it, is a fiction, a fallacy, a falsehood, one might say. Like y'all think you know what you're talking about, but you don't and you need a group of people to tell you what you think and what you want, okay? Anyway, Lippmann saw stereotypes as a necessity and deemed them useful, but was aware of the fact that they had their limitations and their quote, ideological implications. So first let's address the usefulness and necessity of stereotypes. Bet you never thought you'd hear me say that. As Evans and Nixon note, a la Richard Dyer's 1977 essay, Stereotyping, there's a distinction that should be made between stereotyping and typing or typification. Sorry, this is gonna be a lot of kind of theory, but I'm gonna do my best to make sure that it's, it's digestible because I'm still even trying to understand what some of this is. See, the way Dyer saw it, we understand the world by processing different events, objects, and people in our minds according to how they fit within the culture and place them or place the things and people and events where they need to go. Dyer argued that without the use of types, it would be difficult and even impossible for us to make sense of the world around us. An example, I see an object with four legs and a flat surface and decode that as a table or a stool. It might be a kind of table I've never seen before, but it generally fits into what I know to be a table or stool based off what people in the culture have defined a table or stool to be. You know what I'm saying? Are you following? This mental organizing process helps us better understand objects, people, and events that we ingest on a daily basis. And it helps us order them in a way so that this simulation around us makes sense. As Dyer sees it, we're always trying to make sense of things through our wider understanding of that thing. So bringing it back to people, to know something about someone, we use the roles that person performs, child, parent, lover, student, boss, etc., And then we assign them a group based on gender, race, class, ethnicity. And then we organize them into personality types, happy, gloomy, INFJ, Scorpio, Hufflepuff, whatever. If we think about the table example, the limitations of this kind of typification is that people are not tables. Even if you get more and more specific about the intersections of someone's identity, humans are ever-changing contradictory beings. So that's where we get into the ideological implications and limitations of stereotyping. So a lot of the stuff that I said before fall into typification. That's the ordering process. That's us using what we observe and our cultural reference point to organize things in our minds. But as I said, it's not so great because people are ever changing. So when we get into the limits of this typification is when we get into the meat and potatoes of what it means to stereotype someone. As Evans and Nixon see it, stereotyping is us getting a hold of a few easy to grasp characteristics about someone and reducing everything about them to those traits. This causes us to exaggerate and simplify a person. Girl, she got herself a handful of them. He was all up in my stuff one. So their first point in breaking this down is a stereotyping quote, reduces, essentializes, naturalizes, and fixes difference. And their second point is that it uses a strategy of splitting, dividing what's normal to what's abnormal and unacceptable. Remember a while back when I was talking about Janet Jackson and Justin? Card and how white masculinity needed the black female body to be the other it was measured against, that's what that splitting is. It's saying that this is what is normal and anything that deviates from that isn't and is therefore unacceptable. And that's how we get into the construction of the other. Who's with me? Ah, Darius, black athlete of Compton, blue chip prospect, stand with thee. I, Yolanda, drug dealer of the block and high priestess of hell, have got thy back. And I, Tanisha the thickest. Back thine ass up, oh, 
Before we go any further, I need y'all to know that this is from a sketch comedy show called Astronomy Club on Netflix. They canceled season two and y'all need to reboot it because it is actually hilarious. You think this sketch is going somewhere and then when it ends, you're like, oh my God. It is hilarious and it is a brilliant take on just how dumb a lot of these stereotypical depictions are and how they get greenlit by these white execs even when there are black employees trying to tell them this is not the wave or they never have a black employee or a, an employee of a marginalized group or community being like, do not do this. So yeah, definitely check out the show and let's get back to the video. Evans and Nixon talk about how important it is to understand the symbolic and social order that's trying to be maintained when it comes to understanding why we stereotype in the first place. As I've said in other videos, labels can be a great way of finding community, but when we're talking about stereotyping, there's this line between the normal or standard community and the social exile of people who don't fit into that. This kind of feels confusing. Okay, let me give you a real life example. There have been a lot of conversations about gender identity and sexuality in the mainstream. And talking specifically about sexuality for a moment, queer folks are seen as outliers because what's normal is to be straight. So the result of this social ordering or straight as normal and queer as deviant is that you get depictions of queer people as hypersexual, non-committal, and having an almost like exotic sort of lifestyle. Queerness becomes a place and a culture where straight people can dip their toes in it, quote drag race, flirt with queer people for attention, and then go back to their normal lives, having experienced what it's like to explore the sexual deviance of society. And that seeing of queer people as other and the subsequent exclusion that comes from that is how you get those stereotypical depictions of queer folks in television and media when we are not the ones telling our own stories. I had an amazing conversation with Ben Peachy from Screenshot Media, I'll link it below, but they basically said this thing that I was like, you have to repeat it again, and it was... I do often feel like we're only fully accessible if we're fully consumable, and like the feeling oh. of being consumed is disgusting because we're not a commodity. Can you say that one more time? That was just a word. <laughs> you're only accessible if you're consumable. <sighs> but I hope me using that example of breaking down the construction of otherness helps it make a bit more sense because you can use that for many other types of marginalized groups. So if y'all can think of some examples, comment them below and let me know how you view what groups or if it's from your own background or one part of your identity that you see being stereotyped or being constructed as an other measured against something else. Why'd you call me? What? Why'd you call me? I told you, man. Dude came yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. So we can't discuss stereotyping and the construction of other without acknowledging the power dynamics that are at play. Y'all always hear me say there's power in representation and how I previously understood that to mean was that there's power in seeing yourself reflected in the world around you and in the media you consume. I now have a different understanding of that thanks to our good old representation book. How I now understand it, thanks to Evans, Nixon, and Hall just graciously explaining this, is that there is power in representation when you're the one in control of marking, assigning, and classifying people into certain categories and characteristics. It's a symbolic and social power to be able to depict a group a certain way and have others go along with it. A couple of examples. The long history of blackface minstrelsy in Europe, Canada, and America. Another one, as some of y'all will remember from a few weeks back, is Edward Said's concept of Orientalism, about how the West was able to construct this fantasy of the East, sociologically, politically, ideologically, all of the things. Moving beyond just the standard stereotypes being constructed through this power dynamic, we also have to think about, you know, folks like me who love to analyze, dissect, and produce discourse around different marginalized groups. Because it, it's all well and good, but even in that, I and others like me that are interested in talking about these sorts of things need to be mindful of what kinds of narratives we're producing through this discourse about the racialized knowledge of the other. Does that make sense? Do y'all ever just stop sometimes and ask yourself, what's the point? <laughs> like, seriously, why are we even here? Like, why do we exist? You know what I'm saying? You ever just think about it just like a little bit? Mm. 
anyway, that concept that I just mentioned in talking about what we kind of have to be mindful of, even if we're analyzing different racialized groups and things like that, is from a dude named Foucault. I think that's how you say his name. Look him up if you want to know more about him, because I, I I simply didn't have the time, but it's just called knowledge power is how they talk about it in this book. So now let's talk about how this power bleeds into the fantasy of these stereotypes. We'll keep it real. We respect them that are killing. So when we see them, we don't think of nothing negative to them because we want to be that image. You want people, we want people to feel the oh, way we feel yeah, for yeah. Them, to feel about us the way we feel about him. Fear. Yeah. yeah. We want people to fear us. Well, I come from a place where I want fear. Look at my career. I thrived off of fear because I was afraid. Mm -hmm. I wanted people to fear me. In this representation book, they discuss the idea of circulatory power and how whether you're powerful or powerless, you're just as caught up in this cycle. And an example they use to break this down is black masculinity or the way it's depicted. Kind of like how Saeed describes the West's first interactions with the East, when white was first interacting with black, this narrative of black Africans as primitive savages developed and this fear and envy developed along with that. So to combat that or reconcile those two opposing forces, i.e. fear of the black male body, but also envy of its difference and perhaps envy of its perceived power. Sengali's wrestling yeah. in Dakar championship. Beautiful. Is, it's and if you see some of these guys, you see what their bodies look like. It's so, it's so ridiculous. Like, like they, they live on fish and rice. I mean, Frank went there, it's so poor. And he said, you just see dudes where you're like, well, if I had a body like that, I would never wear clothes. White slave masters used to use a denial of masculine attributes to black men to keep them in check. Think about how many movies you see where the racist white character is calling the grown black man boy. Or think about the sexual assault of black women at the hands of white men, even if those black women were married to black men. I can take your woman if I want to. You don't own anything, boy. In all of that, there was this really f***ed up psychological castration and actually literal castration when it came to lynching that contributed to this emasculation of the black man to keep him in his place. Oh no, I'm starting to sound like a whole tap. Ah! <laughs> So going back to circulatory power, you see this retaliation against this idea by black men and black folks in general. And so there are more depictions of black men being tough and powerful, that they're men. So then you have this white supremacist hegemony using that against them and painting black men as aggressors, as hypersexual. And this obviously trickles down into the way black bodies, particularly black male bodies are policed. Treated as childish, some blacks, hmm? Don't you hate when people say blacks? I don't know why it doesn't sit well with me. Okay, we'll just keep going. Treated as childish, some blacks in reaction adopted a macho, aggressive, masculine, sexual nature. Thus, victims can be trapped by the stereotype, unconsciously confirming it by the very terms in which they try to oppose and resist it. So how this sort of paradoxical explanation fits into the fantasy is that representation is working at two levels simultaneously on an overt and conscious level of infantilizing black men, stripping them of their masculine attributes to then cover up the covert attitude of black men as hypersexual domineering men. It goes back to that fear and envy idea and what lies under the surface is that fantasy. So being put between this binary structure, these two places, these stereotypes put black men between two extreme opposites that they end up being quote, obliged to shuttle between, sometimes being represented as both of them at the same time. Evans, Nixon, and Hall go on to note that when we're talking about representation, we have to be aware of not just what's being shown, but what's being implied. Like what isn't being said, but what's implied by the fantasy. And that when you add sex into the equation, well, some interesting things start to happen. Hi, hey, David. David. How are you, sir? <laughs> you like your coffee oh, good, black, good huh? Morning. Good morning to everyone. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm 48. I think my generation, it was taboo for so long that in my generation, the white girls were looking for black guys and the black guy and the, uh, the white boys were looking for black girls. And that's just how it was where I grew up. So back in the early 1800s, a South African woman named Sarah Bartman, named Sarchi Bartman, I think that's how you pronounce her name, other people call her Sarah Bartman, was brought over to London and was basically put on display for scientists and whatever. She was basically put on as an exhibit for five years in London and Paris. She was famously known as the hot and taut Venus and she had 
steatopegia or a protruding buttocks. She just, she just, she just had Miss New Booty. She had a lot of booty. Now Sarah was only four six as well, so people were just like apparently audiences were just fascinated by this woman's small stature and big butt, and they were also um, very fascinated by her genitalia. Uh, basically, in here they talk about how she had an enlargement of the labia caused by the manipulation of the genitalia and considered beautiful by the hot and tots and bushmen. But Europeans weren't used to seeing that. So instead of treating her like a human, she was put on display, exhibited for people to gawk at. This is not the best picture. I'll probably put one up. But yeah, her story is uh, very interesting. If you have never heard of her, I would suggest you check it out. But in examining her story, you can just see how this fetishism played out and just defining fetishism according to this book. It's the quote, strategy by means of which a powerful fascination or desire is both indulged and at the same time denied. Kind of like you can consume the taboo object, but not engage with it, or you're not supposed to. What's being marked as taboo finds this messed up form of representation in fetishism. Oh, I'm sorry. This is so dense, y'all. Okay. So Sarah Bartman was reduced to her body, which was marked as primitive object and therefore taboo to engage with. But it was presented to the public where fantasies about her butt and genitals could be indulged visually, but denied because she was marked as other and therefore not an object meant to be desired. Does that make it make a little more sense? She was an object meant to be consumed through a malicious and voyeuristic sort of curiosity about the black female body. When you think about fetishes, there's this taboo that's associated with them. And when you fetishize a person or a group of people based on fantasies you've conjured up through the stereotypes you've consumed about them, you're not attracted to the person, you're attracted to the taboo idea of what being with that person in whatever way you choose to means. I've been around white guys specifically that will say they prefer to not date white girls. And even if they're trying to be nice to me, it always reads like, what does that even mean? If you see my account, you'll know the stuff I like to talk about. A lot of sociology. In my experience, I have better conversations about that with black women. That's because it affects them. It doesn't affect white women as much. They don't think about it. Black women take care of their men better. And I done better. Yes, I, we will clean you up. It seems like they're more passionate. They're easier to talk to. I always, uh kind of always prefer black women over white. Are white women normal and therefore boring? You want to step into the exotic? You want to try something different that you're not supposed to? Hmm? Hmm? What are you saying, sir? Now, before somebody tries it, saying something like, y'all are upset when people don't like you, and now you're upset that people do like you, pick a side. Or somebody being like, I'm black, and I love when white men love black women. Congrats. That is not what I'm saying here at all. I've mentioned to y'all before that one of my serious boyfriends was white, and the main reason that I was never surprised that he was attracted to me was because he had grown up in a predominantly black neighborhood. So he was used to seeing black women, which is something that I talked a bit about in my Beauties in the Eye of the Colonizer video with that term, a lack of repeated exposure. If you're around media that only shows you stereotypical depictions of hypersexualized black women and you don't really have everyday interactions with them, yeah, it's a little sus when you're like, I just, I just love me a black girl. I just need me a black girl. It's a little sus because your interactions are based off the way media has portrayed them. You see what I'm saying? So you can copy paste, apply that to many different marginalized groups and communities and just analyze why you have that attraction. Just, just question, you know, we all got to do it. And I'm not saying any person dating outside of their race thinks that the person that they're dating is like the secret taboo that they're experimenting with. I don't believe that, but I just think there are way too many dudes on dating apps saying shit to me like the black or the berry, the sweet or the juice, and calling me all kinds of dark chocolate, swirl, mocha, whatevers, okay? So I just need to put it out there that some of y'all need to examine the way you fetishize people is all I'm saying. Okay, I hope this wasn't chaotic. I was like reading this script back and was like, what? This is, ah! There's just a lot of really dense theory and concepts to kind of get your brain around, but let's quickly summarize what we went over today, okay? We define what stereotyping is. It's just taking some easy to grab on concepts and characteristic traits and reducing people to those things. Labeling and identifying things helps us, you know, in our brains, figure out what, what's going on in the greater context. 
But the limitations of stereotyping come in many different forms, included but not limited to the construction of otherness, saying this is what's normal, this is what is not normal, and therefore this is what is unacceptable. There's also the power dynamic of being able to mark and identify and categorize people or stereotype them. There's power in being able to show how you want to represent people versus how they see themselves. The ideal of fantasy is at play too and contributes to a weird circulatory power system where people will have the power to dictate how someone's represented and maybe sometimes if someone's trying to combat that, then you have the role of fantasy, the overt way that someone is stereotyped or a group of people are stereotyped, but underneath that is that covert fantasy of what they're actually thinking, what's actually trying to be implied. And that causes that circulatory power where people kind of bang their heads up against a wall because in trying to circumvent those stereotypical depictions, they're kind of playing into the fantasy that's secretly being said. And then of course you add the sexual element into all of this and you get fetishism. You get people deeming something that is othered, that is different as taboo and wanting to still engage with it but in this weird voyeuristic kind of, of creepy curiosity of, of stepping into something that you're not supposed to, to like or want. I hope this, this final thoughts breakdown made it make more sense. I sincerely, you know, apologize if this was very dense. This is probably gonna be the most dense I'll get on this stuff because it's a lot. But yeah, I hope y'all enjoyed this. I hope you learned a bit. I would honestly just recommend you pick up this book. Uh, it's, it's basically a textbook, honestly, truly. But yeah, just go through it, pick out some chapters, do some reading. It's for, there are some chapters that I'm really excited to get into. Um, there's one about masculinity in here that I'm excited to talk about, but yeah. And feed your pets, water your plants, feed, feed your plets, water your plets, uh, and drink water. I'm gonna do that because Lord have mercy, I, okay. I will see y'all in the next one. Bye. <laughs> Pray for me. I'll try that again. So, oh, ow, 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 ow. Oh my God. We need to figure out. Final thoughts, that's the final thoughts. Okay. There's this, get some, okay. We'll finish this first and then get some ice, okay. As some of y'all will remember from, define what, ah, my arm is killing me. Oh my God, ow. Brilliant clap, brilliant. Oh. Necessity. Where is it? Where's that book? It's necessary. Ah! The Let's do this. Oh God. Ugh.